Hi guys, this is Avionics, equipment of civil aircraft, and today we will start talking about uh, first lecture in the uh, short course of uh, lectures uh, uh, about uh, onboard equipment of civil aircraft. And uh, logically, first of all, we need to talk about uh, historical development of uh, onboard equipment of aircraft. That's why we will start from history. Some of uh, them can uh, ask why we should to talk about history. Um, from my side, uh, history uh, plays an important role in avionics development uh, because electronics uh, developed significantly and it makes a few significant leaps uh, during the whole history of uh, electronic uh, presence. And uh, of course it will be reflected in uh, different systems, in structure of avionics on board of aircraft. That's why uh, uh, the process of uh, historical development of uh, avionics uh, plays an important role. Uh, also, some uh, systems uh, has been raised during this period and then has been passed away because uh, uh, technology uh, cannot meet uh, future requirements of uh, performance, for example. That's why during this 100 years of uh, avionics, uh, we've got uh, a plenty of uh, technologies that uh, can be uh, regret uh, from further development. That's why uh, it makes sense to talk about uh, historical development, uh, to know what's going on uh, with uh, different systems. Also quite important that uh, the life cycle of aircraft uh, may be quite long. I don't want to talk about historical aircraft. However, if you talk about some particular helicopters or aircraft, uh, the lifetime of uh, the body of this aircraft can be up to 30 years. And, uh, of course, during that time, uh, equipment a little bit uh, can be changed. Uh, approximately new systems can be invented and uh, can be uh, uh, mandatory to be placed on board of aircraft. That's why uh, during the, uh, the life uh, time of each aircraft uh, present, we need to uh, make some improvements uh, due to uh, new system requirements. That's why it is also important to talk about uh, historical development of avionics, because uh, in current stage of avionics, uh, in aviation, uh, we have uh, different types of uh, systems uh, operated uh, actually nowadays. That's why it is historical and uh, up to date. Thus, we need to know what's going on and taking into account some uh, old fashioned technologies. Okay, and uh, I think we uh, need uh, to begin from the uh, beginning of aviation and um, as you know I hope the first flight uh, take place in England and uh, I am talking about uh, right uh, first flight Bra right brothers and uh, it was happened in 1903 and uh, usually uh, from this date we need, uh, we have a uh, uh, come down of uh, aviation. That's why this date is a birth of aviation. However, from my point of view, uh, aviation uh, has been uh, d 
created a little bit early because uh, nowadays in uh, aviation we consider uh, balloons and balloons and uh, some kind of airships uh, has been invented and used uh, many years ago before 1903. Thus, um, from some point of view, we need to talk about some pre uh, pre uh, preliminary uh, time period of aviation present, uh, especially for uh, flying vehicles uh, lighter than uh, air. And uh, if you talk about uh, also avionics equipment, uh, let's try to... Uh, understand what kind of equipment uh, we can refer to the first avionics uh, means on board of airplane. And in this case uh, I would like to uh, close my uh, eyes for uh, some engine operation circuits and uh, be more focused in electronics. Uh, actually on some equipment of aircraft and in this case uh, of course we need to talk about radio on board of aircraft because uh, after the first development of um, airplane uh, it was uh, hardly need uh, to take uh, connection with the ground because uh, any flight need to be assist with a person on ground to uh, to manage uh, some uh, data, for example, navigation data, or to uh, guide aircraft near the airfield. Thus, uh, first air traffic controllers uh, require some uh, type of connection between aircraft and ground. Thus. Radio, it was uh, the first uh, avionics equipment uh, from my point of view. Uh, and uh, the, if we also talk about historical aircraft, because uh, needs in aviation services was gross immediately when aviation was invented. And... Uh, Approximately in 10 years, it was uh, first passenger aircraft and it was first airline. And uh, to perform flight uh, support, uh, historical air traffic uh, managers uh, or persons uh, who perform this function uh, usually helps a pilot for navigating from uh, one point to another with the with visual rules because uh, uh, those days we do not have we did not have any navigational aids we've got only radio and we've got uh, radio on the ground and that's all thus uh, pilots uh, had to report uh, to air traffic controllers uh, their own location based on visual rules and air traffic controllers use uh, paper map uh, to point location of aircraft and to perform uh, initial surveillance. Thus, uh, many years ago, air traffic management was uh, so difficult uh, task, and of course, safety of aviation was quite poor. A uh, little bit later, uh, electronics became more popular and uh, the next uh, people try to think how we can improve uh, radio to perform some uh, particular navigation purposes, for example, guidance in airspace. And uh, the first that uh, has been invented, it was just simple directional finder based on loop uh, antenna. Loop antenna has form like uh, this one. Yep, this is circle. 
circle coil. And uh, the main benefit of this loop antenna is that uh, a gain function has direction. And if we can uh, connect our loop antenna to simple uh, receiver or radio and uh, rotate loop antenna mechanically, we can identify a direction of radio signal coming. And uh, it makes possibility to create first uh, navigational aid. Also, uh, here you can see the uh, structure of non-directional beacon. It was just a simple uh, omnidirectional uh, dipole antenna, which transmit a radio signal at particular radio frequency. And during the flight, uh, pilots can uh, tune uh, a frequency channel of uh, this radio beacon and then a specific person on board should to rotate loop antenna and uh, then mechanically direction to their source of uh, this non-directional beacon uh, had been uh, detected. Thus it was a uh, first uh, navigational aid and uh, it helps a lot. Nowadays we called it classical uh, navigation approach. Uh, during the whole flight path, a network of navigational aids has been created. However, first, uh, first navigational aids, it was only non-directional beacon, uh, like this one. And uh, then during the flight, a uh, person on board of aircraft uh, should uh, detect uh, direction to their directional beacon. And uh, what uh, pilots need to do, just uh, try to follow their constant uh, angle or direction to the radio beacon to get uh, to reach uh, the beacon location. That's why uh, many years ago it helps a lot uh, for airplane navigation and it makes possible to travel from one airfield to another. A little bit later, uh, particular 90, 30, uh, 19, uh, 37, 35, uh, quite uh, important uh, event uh, had place. Actually, it was uh, first uh, cross uh, cross planet, cross globe flight uh, performed by Emilia Earhart. Uh, she would she would uh, she would like to be the first woman uh, who's piloting uh, aircraft uh, around the globe. And uh, her approach or her flight was unsuccessful and her aircraft uh, was disappeared. And up to now we do not know exactly what's going on with her aircraft and where it was uh, uh, landed uh, or what's happened. However, uh, this aircraft uh, was equipped with uh, the most update, with the most modern navigation equipment for those times. That's why uh, this event was also documented very well. That's why uh, reading uh, equipment list of aircraft, we can uh, understand uh, the level of navigation systems and the level of uh, avionics on board of such kind uh, aircraft. That's why uh, if you talk about navigation equipment, uh, you can see that on board uh, they use magnetic compass. Nowadays we know that magnetic compass uh, it's not accurate. And we need to take into account magnetic anomalies. Thus, uh, we need to use a precise map of these magnetic anomalies 
to identify a particular direction. Many years ago, it was not, it, it was absent, and uh, that's why it uh, provides particular problems. Then, on board, uh, they have uh, the radio, and uh, she has conventional loop antenna to identify direction to their uh, specific beacons. That's why. In this case, uh, you, you see that uh, loop antenna and directional finder already was present and used in uh, civil application. And uh, she has some celestial navigation equipment. Uh, however, celestial navigation on board of historical aircraft is not a good idea because uh, historical aircraft usually uh, fly uh, near the clouds or inside of cloud clouds, thus it makes some problems and also celestial navigation does not provide quite precisely coordinates of airplane location. Thus uh, you can see that uh, for those aircraft uh, the radio and uh, receiver and transmitter of course uh, it means and uh, directional finder based on loop antenna was uh, placed on board of such kind type of uh, aircraft. Also, uh, at uh, time of uh, 1930, it was time when radar technology uh, became raised. Uh, if you know that uh, radar it is a specific sensor for uh, radio ranging and identification. Uh, here you can see uh, the first radar antennas and uh, radar's configuration. And also we need to know that uh, radars it was uh, secret military technology approximately for 30 years. Thus, uh, from 90, 1930, it was uh, only beginning and it was top secret technology for uh, uh, militaries. Uh, a little bit later, uh, we need to specify the period of Second World War, because uh, during that time, uh, a plenty of uh, aviation technologies was invented and uh, after the period of Second World War the main list of uh, avionics uh, has been done and uh, most of this list uh, nowadays we use. Thus, period of Second World War it was a huge leap also for uh, avionics equipment uh, development. And first of all, we need to talk about uh, radars, because uh, radars technology already was invented and it was uh, also quite difficult uh, technical task to put a uh, radar on board of aircraft. And uh, also at, the, at that time, first on board radar, uh, has been invented. Also, you can see the configuration of antenna system and some uh, structural elements of those uh, radars. Also, we need to take attention that uh, during that time we do not have transistors and microelectronics and even digital electronics. It means that Everything that was present was built uh, in analog format and it was uh, uh, created with the help of vacuum tubes. Uh, and it means that it, you, it, it, it weighed a lot and it uh, plays uh, a huge size on board. However, it was integrated and during that time, uh, first on board radars uh, has been appeared. 
Next, quite important, uh, because during their uh, Second World War, aircraft uh, required to perform a uh, flight task in uh, quite uh, big ranges from their, uh, from their location of airfield. And it required uh, some navigation uh, some navigation systems which helps to identify aircraft location. Because if you remember, uh, only uh, directional finder, network of navigation beacons, and that's all. If we talk about flying under unknown uh, relief, it may be a serious problem for navigation and many aircraft has been lost uh, those days. Uh, therefore, uh, scientists tried to think about first global navigation system and uh, they uh, uh, switched to hyperbolic uh, navigation. Thus, uh, first hyperbolic navigation system has been ground on a quite simple approach. They use uh, uh, hyperbola to identify aircraft location. And hyperbola, it is a specific curve uh, for which uh, difference in distances between two focal points or between between two focuses of this hyperbola is constant. What does it mean? It means if we have focus B and focus A and if we can get any point on this hyperbola, the difference of distances will be constant. And this constant distance will give us line of location in hyperbola. This is like a hyperbola rule that difference of distance is true, is constant. And uh, what we need, we just can place different transmitters uh, with omnidirectional antenna system and uh, we can use simple receiver uh, to identify time traveling, oh sorry, to identify time difference between receiving signal from A station and receiving signal from B. And uh, this uh, difference in time is proportional to difference in distances. And it means uh, we can use it as a hyperbola line of location. Thus, if, you know, if uh, we transmit uh, signal A from uh, focus point of this hyperbola, and if we transmit at particular time uh, radio pulse uh, B from focus point B, then uh, what we need, we just need to count uh, time difference between coming uh, these uh, signals at receiver. And uh, this uh, pulse difference uh, will be uh, proportional uh, to their distance difference. Because uh, speed of radio waves propagation is constant and equal 3 multiplied with the 10 power 8 meters per second. Thus, we, we don't know when uh, this system transmit navigation system uh, signal, however, we can count uh, time difference between uh, receiving uh, both signals. And by this time difference, we can get a hyperbola line of location. And then uh, what we need, we just need to use another uh, transmitter like C and then uh, create another hyperbola. And two hyperbolas will be crossing only in two points. One of them we can uh, miss uh, due to uh, long location from previous uh, coordinate. This is the main idea of uh, hyperbolic navigation. And uh, during the Second World War, uh, different countries uh, tried to develop their own 
uh, hyperbolic navigation chains on networks. And uh, after the Second World War, uh, the first Loran hyperbolic navigation system was formed, which, uh, uh, which uh, connects different ground stations in one network. Uh, and uh, here you can see their map of uh, Loran sea coverage. Uh, within which uh, precise coordinates of aircraft or vessel location can be measured. And also, uh, Loran C uh, ground station uh, adduct in Alaska. Here. Next important technology, which uh, was invented during the Second World War, or uh, it was not invented, actually, theory of inertial navigation was invented uh, much more early. However, no one before uh, tried to use it, because uh, it was impossible to uh, apply it in real life. Thus, uh, during the period of Second World War, uh, German scientists uh, at first time implement inertial principle inside of inertial navigation system. What is the idea of inertial navigation? Quite simple. If we have a reference frame, Cartesian reference frame, x-axis, y-axis, and uh, z-axis. And let me know our location, maybe point A with coordinates x-a, y-a, z-a. Then, if we can measure dx, dy, and dz, it means path of airplane during uh, some period of time uh, by uh, different axes. We can easily get a location of point B. And actually it is the main idea of inertial navigation. Uh, coordinates of our current location is equal coordinates of our previous location plus difference of passes by uh, coordinates uh, getting uh, through some time. These passes we can count with the help of accelerometers. Uh, and this passes is equal double integral by time from acceleration. Uh, thus, on board of aircraft we just need to have three accelerometers, which can measure accelerate accelerations by uh, axes. And if you know it, uh, yes, we can get these passes and we can get our uh, location at uh, any time during the aircraft traveling. However, we have some problem, because during the flight, aircraft body is rotated. And it requires to use specific uh, gimbal uh, system, like this one, to uh, place our accelerometers at the, for example, horizontal plane of X and Y uh, reference frame. Thus, uh, we use uh, gimbal uh, system mechanical which use motors guided by three gyroscopes to uh, place three accelerometers in particular direction during the whole flight. And it helps to identify uh, location of aircraft or rocket. However, inertial navigation was invented actually not for aviation. It was used in uh, uh, V one rockets uh, to reach England from territory of Germany. And uh, we know exactly that 
performance of uh, inertial navigation system was not uh, so perfect. Therefore, uh, most rockets cannot reach even a city, particular city. And we do not talk about like uh, finding uh, or getting precision like in one kilometers. Uh, precision of such kind historical inertial system it was like plus minus 100 kilometers it means that if we reach some city it will be glad if we reach <laughs> uh, great britain uh, not uh, sea it will be also great from german side and uh, and uh, from a positive point, yes, uh, inertial navigation has been invented and it was, uh, it used very poor precision that cannot be implemented in uh, such kind of uh, aviation technology. Uh, and uh, at the final, uh, after the Second World War, uh, inertial navigation approach has been uh, studied uh, very well by different scientists from different countries and it uh, gives uh, a huge impulse for inertial navigation development and uh, in 1950 we, we, 15, uh, we have uh, already operated on board uh, inertial navigation system with uh, quite good precision for those times. Uh, let's go next. Also, during the Second World War, instrument landing system was introduced. Uh, the idea of instrument landing was always topical. Uh, why? Because uh, day or night period of time uh, reduce minimums of visual range uh, requirements in performing flight in different okay in most uh, weather condition independently requires to develop inertial landing system and also uh, uh, I think you know that landing it is the most dangerous phase of flight and onboard equipment was not uh, so good thus inertial or instrument landing system was required the main idea of instrument landing system or ILS quite simple it uh, generates uh, two uh, beams of uh, two different signals and uh, on board we have receiver which receives both of these signals and count difference in uh, modulation amplitude and uh, this difference is proportional to deviations from glide slope trajectory Thus, uh, on board of historical aircraft, we have equipment like that with two arrows, which indicates uh, present of aircraft on glide slope. Also, you know that aircraft uh, should land at quite uh, slim uh, glide slope trajectory, and if a pilot uh, will change angle of landing a little bit it will be quite uh, dangerous and may finish dramatically thus uh, ILS was required and during the second world war it was uh, event invented and implemented for uh, military aviation of course a little bit later it was implemented and up to now uh, we use uh, the same ideas that was invented uh, approximately 
70 years ago. The next important uh, onboard system, it was uh, air traffic control radar beacon system. Uh, during the war or military uh, operation, uh, they required to identify if it is uh, our friend or if or it can be some uh, some bad guy. Uh, thus, uh, a radar beacon system. Uh, was invented like automatic uh, responding system to identify uh, whose aircraft is. That's why uh, after the Second World War, uh, this technology was implemented in a secondary radar system and nowadays is used for identification uh, of uh, aircraft uh, code for everyone, including uh, other airspace users. After the Second World War, it was another time slot from 1950 up to 1960. Uh, it was invented uh, low-range radio altimeter. Also, uh, landing is quite dangerous phase of flight and a uh, number of uh, control flight into terrain required to introduce new onboard equipment. And it was low range radio altimeter. The main idea of radio altimeter it is to measure exact distance between aircraft and ground. Because uh, before all flights uh, have been performed with the help of barometric altimeter. Thus, a radio altimeter gives us particular range in meter between aircraft body and ground. The main idea of uh, low radio altimeter works is the following. On board we have a frequency generator which, gener which generates a uh, sinusoidal uh, radio signal with changing frequency. And this frequency usually is uh, changed by some kind of uh, triangular fo form. Thus, uh, at the beginning it will be rises and then decreases. Here we've got frequency. Uh, thus, particular signal will be sent to transmitter and then uh, transmitted via antenna system uh, on the bottom part of aircraft. Then after the radio wave propagation it will be reflected from the ground and come back to another antenna of uh, aircraft. Uh, then will be directed to receiver and then uh, we can extract radio frequency of signal which has been transmitted. However, due to radio frequency changing each uh, time, each second, each millisecond, uh, after the receiving this uh, frequency, okay, frequency is still the same. However, during the change in radio frequency by frequency genera generator, when it comes back to receiver, uh, we will have another transmitting frequency. Thus, we just need to find the difference between the frequencies. And this difference will be proportional to the distance. Will be proportional to the time of uh, signal absent on board of aircraft. And then this time is proportional to the range between aircraft and ground. Thus, uh, after that time, up to 1960, uh, low range radio altimeters uh, begin appearing on board of civil aircraft. Next, uh, also quite important that uh, after the Second World War, radar te technology will be integrated into the civil aviation because 
uh, at this time it was uh, created two sides military and civil uh, aviation support and uh, civil uh, network of radars it was a first sensor in uh, in air traffic controller uh, to support uh, air traffic management uh, therefore during that time uh, secondary surveillance radar okay primary surveillance radar and uh, implementation of secondary surveillance radar will be uh, done and it helps a lot uh, at the particular job of air traffic controller uh, 1960 it is also quite tricky thing because during that time it was invented transistor and it uh, stimulate a huge leap in the any electronic devices before transistor it was only vacuum bulbs which is quite uh, heavy and uh, requires a lot of size and uh, a lot of power uh, power thus uh, introduce introduction of transistor make a revolution in electronics and it changed on board avionics significantly because if before we use a radio half meter half meter half meter after transistor we have 20 centimeters 20 centimeters 20 centimeters thus uh, transistor technology uh, it is a huge leap for all avionics equipment and uh, also you can see that uh, transistor technologies uh, immediately will be integrated in different parts including inertial navigation system and uh, here you can see uh, some gimbal inertial navigation systems uh, based on uh, transistor technologies also during that time uh, it was uh, in invention of global navigation satellite system because uh, if you remember okay I, rem I don't remember however I remember from some book that uh, uh, during that time first articles about radio beacons uh, placement on their uh, on their orbit of our planet uh, has been proposed and uh, also we think that from those time uh, global navigation satellite system was developed and uh, we've got what we, we've got 1970 80 uh, here I can introduce that uh, we already have transistor technology which begin to park in micro micro schemes and micro schemes help us uh, to switch to digital electronics and first of all during that time flight management system was introduced at first for some research uh, thing uh, and also microwave landing system microwave landing system much more uh, precise than instrument landing system and it is uh, more simple in uh, maintain however uh, for uh, those time uh, all airfield has been uh, has been uh, equipped with uh, ILS equipment and also on all on board aircraft uh, we also has ILS uh, uh, equipment thus uh, transformation to the next generation of microwave landing system it was not uh, adopted however based on uh, modern roadmaps 
uh, MLS till present. Thus, uh, I, I think that in future, uh, if some another technology will not be available, uh, MLS uh, may, uh, may be rise again. Uh, also quite important, I would like to mark that uh, approximately in 90, uh, 1980, uh, it was introduced flight management system and uh, flight management system helps to helps pilot a lot because uh, all routine operation uh, has been implemented inside of some programs or algorithms of FMS and it helps to reduce number of uh, flight uh, flight pilot on board and uh, it helps to get only captain and uh, first officer and it will be enough to perform a uh, flight uh, of uh, heavy aircraft then uh, then we have 1990 1990 it is a computer revolution before 1990 we have Computers like uh, big boxes, big screens with multiple switchers, okay, something like that. After that, after 1990, we have small PC, personal computer. And now we have mobile phones, which is much more powerful than, than first personal computers. And this is development of electronics. And it creates a huge uh, step for uh, evolution of electronics. If before we have transistor and micro scheme, and we have analog and some part of digital uh, signals after computer revolution, everything will be based on personal computers. It means that uh, here you can see the avionics bay and you can see uh, multiple boxes from particular systems and nowadays each box has uh, the same structure that we have in personal computer. We have processor, we have uh, some digital data bus and we have some uh, analog and particular sensors. However, the basic structure much more common with a personal computer. And it means that we switch uh, from system design, from hardware level to the software level. And it creates a huge possibility for system integration and for system development. Thus, uh, during that time, we transform, transform uh, particular uh, function algorithms to the software part. And of course, it began time of network technology on board. Because we've got multiple computers, we need to make deal with this data, thus only digital data links uh, based on network te technology it is uh, only things that we can use. Thus, computer revolution 1990 uh, creates a huge step for development of avionics and transformation of onboard equipment of aircraft. And uh, also for those time, we've got first electronic flight instrument system. I can show you just two pictures. Aircraft uh, developed before, it was Antonov 24, you can see uh, typical uh, equipment design in cockpit and uh, here you can see up to date for those uh, time electronic flight instrument system based on vacuum tube. 
uh, here you can see multiple uh, screens where digital program draw particular data. Thus, electronic flight instrument system of Antonov 70, for example, it is a great demonstration of technology. Of course, we need to know that uh, the development, uh, the building of Antonov 70 was uh, so long that it was finished only uh, in 20 years. Uh, due to some problems in uh, USSR. Uh, also, this time it is a time of development of micro electromechanical systems or MEMS. It helps also a huge leap for sensor level because uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes uh, became uh, more precise and uh, with a reduced size and weight. Also during that time, uh, ground proximity warning system was uh, introduced. Uh, however, this system was uh, not so precise and grounds only on a comparison of uh, particular parameters of aircraft in order to identify a potential collision with the relief. Uh, as an example, this system used comparison of uh, data from radio altimeter with the descent rate or with the airspeed or with the data from barometrical altimeter. Uh, next, next time it is uh, 2000. During those time, terrain awareness and warning system was introduced, and it was a result of uh, improving of GPVS into the new system of eGPVS or enhanced ground proximity warning system. And uh, the idea of eGPVS was absolutely different from GPVS. Uh, EGPVS use precise position obtained from uh, GNSS and comparison it with a digital elevation model. And uh, EGPVS use prediction of aircraft movement to predict future collision with a relief based on coordinates and digital elevation model of the globe. Because relief is a stable and if you use satellites for precise measurements of 3D model of our planet, it means that this 3D model will be true for quite long period of time. Thus, uh, eGPVS was introduced and from those time it was mandatory for heavy aircraft and helicopter. And also new abbreviation of TAFs uh, was used to identify uh, such, uh, such kind of systems. Also uh, TICAS was recommended by ACAO for international flights around the globe. Terrain uh, Traffic Collision and Avoidance System, TCAS or ACAS, Airborne Collision Avoidance System, uh, was used uh, was use, uh, specific um, secondary surveillance radar on board of aircraft to identify location uh, of another airspace users. And uh, it tried to track uh, own aircraft uh, trajectory and uh, predict future location of uh, aircraft and all other aircraft around. And if uh, this system identify uh, reducing of minimums of separation, it generates some alarming for both pilots. And also, it uh, generates 
particular commands for pilots uh, for uh, performing maneuver in vertical plane to avoid collision, mid-air collision. Thus, TICAS, it was uh, first system for safety improvement of airplane. And it was introduced approximately in 2000. 2010. I think it is a time when ADS-B technology was developed. And based on that, each airspace user should use particular equipment to identify its location in space. Thus, everyone who would like to use controlled airspace should to share location measured by onboard uh, satellite navigation system or another system uh, with all other airspace users by particular radio signals. And uh, for global implementation, uh, onboard transponder of 1090 MHz was uh, chosen. Thus, uh, aircraft transponder of uh, more 1090 extended scooter uh, was uh, globally recommended for any airspace user. Includes balloon, airship, uh, gliders and UAV as well. Uh, also, if you talk about ADSB, also we need to take talk that during those time multilateration technologies uh, will be introduced uh, in many airports. The idea of multilateration it is just using ten or more antennas in the airfield to receive signals of ADSB. Based on uh, these signals. Uh, multi uh, server equipment will uh, analyze time difference between uh, fixing ADSB signals in different antennas and uh, applying hyperbolic uh, navigation formulas to get uh, aircraft location. Thus, a multilateration system. Uh, uh, is a cheap uh, surveillance technology for uh, for uh, airport vicinity and uh, after invention such kind of system uh, has been introduced uh, quite uh, quite speedy around the globe and nowadays most airport uh, airports uh, are equipped with uh, a multi uh, ground system. Also, 2015-2016, it is a time of electronic aviation development. And here, as an example, you can see during this uh, period of time, uh, Solar Impulse project perform uh, its first international flight based on solar energy only and uh, beginning from this time also multiple uh, variation of electronic aircraft was introduced and nowadays we have a plenty of uh, flying vehicles based on uh, only electrical uh, power supply and of course, it is a future of aviation. 2020, uh, I can refer to synthetic vision. Uh, just imagine, if we have precise location of where we are, precise coordinates measured by satellite navigation system, with a performance, performance less than 10 meters. And what if we have quite precise 
3D model of relief. And uh, what if we have also precise picture of uh, terrain surface? And this picture we can uh, dress under our relief model. And this dressed on relief uh, creates like interactive uh, vision of three-dimensional world. And what if we place a aircraft in this three-dimensional interactive world? We will have synthetic vision. Synthetic vision system generates picture of 3D world based on a precise location of aircraft and show pilots what they can see if they uh, see in the glass. Thus, uh, synthetic vision generates picture like Google Earth. However, uh, on board of aircraft and usually it is in electronic flight instrument system and pilots can see clearly what is outside of airplane. Also, because we have ADS-B technology and because we have identification cords of each airspace user, we can put uh, three-dimensional models of these airspace users at particular place based on ADS-B technology. And also we can visualize these three-dimensional texture models in our synthetic vision system. Thus, synthetic vision systems helps a lot and uh, of course it is a future of electronic flight instrument system uh, because it helps to perform flight with uh, low visibility or with uh, zero visibility. And it is important because it does not use any signals. It based only on position measured uh, on board of aircraft. Also, a uh, synthetic vision system has been implemented based on head-up display. If you know that head-up system was uh, in, introduced on board of aircraft many years ago. However, uh, those time it was uh, uh, switched to their civil aviation. Thus, 2020 synthetic vision system and head-up display appeared on board of civil aircraft to improve uh, safety of aviation. Also, during that time, uh, multiple ground networks of software-defined radios has been introduced to perform like open uh, ADSB data uh, exchange. Uh, in parallel, uh, global uh, satellite network of SDR receivers was introduced. And nowadays we, we can uh, get a precise location of each airspace user around the globe uh, from uh, any uh, place uh, of world. Uh, and it helps of uh, specific uh, microsatellites on the low orbit which uh, host software defined radio and can receive and decode ADSB messages and then uh, pack and send it via the Inmarsat to the ground data processing center for further processing, storage, and visualization. Uh, thus, uh, at that time, I think we need to stop and wait for next uh, future technologies. Uh, as you can see, uh, avionics and avionics development is uh, directly connected with uh, electronics 
development. And we can define a few important stages. The first one it is 1960 when transistor technology was introduced and it helps us to, to reduce sizes of uh, avionics equipment. And uh, the next important stage it was uh, in computer revolution in 1990 when uh, we switched to digital and uh, it helps to change the system idea from uh, algorithmics and hardware implementation to the software level. And nowadays each system on board it is uh, some kind of computer system which is connected to the onboard uh, network. And all these computers uh, are inside of onboard network and can interrogate each other for data sharing and data processing. Thus, history is important. Okay, and on this word, I think uh, I will stop. And uh, thank you for watching me. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be glad to cl clarify it. See you later. Bye.